and welcome to Culture Club. I am in Union Square standing next to Judith Klausner's Micro Museum, one of the smallest museums in the world. And admission is free. Just come to Union Square and check it out. And the reason we're starting here is the theme of this episode is Somerville's broad and varied collection of public art. We are going to speak with Mayor Joseph Curtitoni about the uh, new art phone boxes around town. And we'll also be speaking with a number of other artists. But to start things off, let's get going with this interactive art quiz. with Mayor Joseph Curtitoni next to one of our newly converted phone booths, which is now a, an objet art. Now, Mayor Curtitoni, you came up with this idea to turn these old phone booths into works of art. How did you dream up this idea? Well, I've been inspired to uh, think abnormally as to how we utilize the whole community as a, a canvas or a medium for to express really our creative and original uh, traits. And the, and the artist community here has really, uh, I guess, pushed my thinking to be more abnormal. So I, 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 I personally saw these relics of, um, of, of urban life <laughs> not being utilized in the modern day of cell phone use and said, you know, let, let's, let's, let's bring art down to the street level. Let's truly make it uh, impact us as we walk by every street corner, every intersection. I love that, and I love the idea of art spilling into the street, so people might not go to galleries, but just walking to work, they might stumble upon things like this. No, I, I agree, you know, we have such a high concentration of artists, second only to New York City in this country, and with that, I think there's not just an opportunity, but a responsibility to share that with everyone, and as we try to activate our streets and sidewalks, what you stumble upon, like this great display could be the most powerful and it takes you out of your the everyday stresses or concerns you have in life it it brings warmth on a on a cold day <laughs> cold some, it is in some cases it really it's some of the best way to express to another human being what it what it means to be a human being so it, it's just so powerful that's lovely um, now do you think Somerville um, kind of sets a trend for being progressive when it comes to art for example you know we paint all our electrical switch boxes in town we started that 15 years ago now Cambridge and Medford and Boston are doing the same uh, I think we're we set a trend for the country and uh, it's been really inspiring and um, fulfilling as a resident that the artists have brought so much vitality to our streets and neighborhoods and whether it's the phone book project or porch fest or what we do in arts union or the open studios or art beat i i we really embrace and leverage our assets of being original and creative and uh, and, and progressive on those values and i would hope and that we continue to think of the community as our canvas, as the clay, as our stage, as our microphone, and continue to express and share that with everyone. That's great. Um, now maybe we should take a moment just to look at Rachel Mello's box. It's a, it's a beautiful conflation of a rural scene with a very urban Somerville scene, but of course it also harks back to when there were cattle grazing in these parts. Right. And, and, it, it, it does, and Somerville was sort of the rural or suburban escape for all the uh, of urban life in downtown. Um, and and there were farms, there were dairy farms down near Porter Square, and uh, and you can see if, if many of the homes and neighborhoods such as Prospect Hill and Central Spring Hill, the uh, the, the horse barns and backyard uh, carriage houses. So, but still, and as we seceded from Charlestown because they were becoming too urban, we've embraced our new urbanism here. So I think it speaks to our historic past and embraces our values that we we love about new urbanism uh, and it's a it's a really cool um, cool display uh, so you were talking about our past now what do you see in the future for Somerville's public art landscape I think the sky's the limit I'm gonna challenge the artists in the community let it rip be abnormal and uh, 
for us, we have seen such a benefit to our quality of life, to embracing and understanding our characteristics, who we are. This is in our DNA, that creativity, that originality, and I, I, I would want to see the, you know, the artist community, the community as a whole, just continue to push these wonderful gifts to life in our everyday walk of life. And um, so, uh, what we're doing more with the phone boots, hopefully we'll have some great things coming to the old transfer station site uh, with the Brick Barton community, the artist community, really expanding what we're doing in Arts Union and, and, and across the city at Open Studios and in our new neighborhoods in Assembly Square. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Mayor Curtitoni. Well, it's great to be here. So you heard it here. Um, Mayor Curtitoni is telling the artist community to let it rip <laughs> and uh, give us your ideas. I'm here with artist Pauline Lim, who recently created this beautiful art installation. Pauline, can you tell us about what this phone booth was like when you found it? Uh, well, it was always filled with garbage from Burger King or Dunkin' Donuts. Um, and you can see right now, there's actually a cup that somebody left. Um, now tell us about the process of um, creating this. How long did it take you and what was involved? So I started in the summer and I had to do some research about um, things withstanding the elements because I've never done outdoor work before um, but I found some paints that are called patio paints and they're meant to be out um, in the outdoors and then I had to do a process um, internally of not being nervous about making something in public so I would put on my iPod and listen to Dan Savage talk about sex like the entire time and I could tune out the world. So. Do you think um, listening to Dan Savage affected your um, <laughs> design at all? I, I don't know, but I was laughing during a lot of it. So, <laughs> And now what's the symbolism with the eyes? Is that kind of a big brother thing? Uh, yes and no. I really felt that um, I wanted to talk about the essential human need to communicate. Um, and so the on the side of the box it says, we need to talk, we need to talk, we need to talk, all over it. And then I also felt like the eyes are such a communicative thing. And then as I was repeating the motif, I thought, oh, well, this is getting repetitive, so I'll make the last one winking at you. <laughs> and um, do you think that is something that we're lacking in our society, that people aren't communicating as well as they might have, or as well as they might? Uh, I think it's always been a difficulty. I don't know if it's any different now, but I, it's, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a lot of loneliness, I think, in life as we live it now. Um, but I don't know, maybe centuries ago it was also lonely. Uh -huh. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you could also take it a step further with today's technology and cell phones. Everyone's so glued to their phone, they're not actually talking to each other. And Maybe not, but they're talking to the person at the other end of the line, right? Yeah, but they're also just playing with their, I don't know, they're playing Candy Crush. and. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I definitely find myself constantly distracted and seeking distraction all the time as well. So. And um, where did you find the old phone and how did you create this great mosaic effect? Uh, we actually bought that phone to use back in the 90s uh, at the Ocean State job lot. <laughs> and I loved the looks of it. And uh, it was back before we had the wireless phone. Um, and I could never throw it away, even after it broke, because it was a piece of, you know, it was a piece of garbage, basically, a very cheap phone. Um, it was so cute. And so I, I kept it all around because I'm a hoarder. And I finally said, oh, I have a use for it, finally. <laughs> so excellent and now you've done several other um, public art installations in the city how do you think that public art like this um, contribute to the city and people's day-to-day -day life well what I'm hoping is that since I personally don't go to galleries that often um, it's nice to have art that sort of is in your path like I'm very busy and I think a lot of people are extremely busy and so you have to really be in people's beaten path in order to have something be seen and it's it's delightful for them I hope excellent well Pauline thank you so much I think we need to start doing aerobics because it's freezing <laughs> okay thank you <laughs> so now we're with Emily Bargov um, at the South Street Farm and first we're gonna start talking about the art map that you created which is available on the Somerville Arts Council website can you tell us why you started that project sure I was um, wondering whether Somerville had an art map because when I visit a new city anywhere in the world, I really like to visit important art pieces and explore the public art that's there. And I looked around online and I asked people and I couldn't find an art map in Somerville. So that's when I got in touch with the Arts Council and um, proposed the idea of creating one. And I worked with a partner, Louisa Beck, to create it and we had a lot of fun doing it. 
And one thing I like about it is it was very interactive. The public was invited to help create the map. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we ran the project as a scavenger hunt. So we invited people to find pieces of art that are in their neighborhood, on their street, or in places that they pass every day. And we invited them to actually contribute those to the map and add them. So it's an ongoing project. It's, it's on the website now and it exists and you can use it, but we hope that people will actually continue to add things as new pieces are created or as we discover more in back alleys or on sidewalks that we haven't even seen before. Nice. So people are still invited to add uh, new examples of public art to the art map. Um, now, Emily, can you tell me about your background in public art? Sure. I Let's see. I have no formal training in public art, but I've always been fascinated by it. I love the idea that art is available to anyone who walks by, that it's not in a museum for people who can pay the entrance fee and I've always enjoyed art that can tell a story particularly that can talk about politics and um, raise issues that are a little bit more sensitive so I actually uh, f studied political murals in Chile which build on the Mexican mural movement and I have have just been fascinated by the power that public art has to transform a space and to bring people together in the creation of that art but also to to say something to a stranger who walks by and now that the art map um, has how many pieces how many pieces are included uh, last I checked, there were about 120, but I, I'm not sure right now. That's great. That's a lot. So people should get out there and um, start checking out some of these pieces. And you're talking about uh, public art in Mexico. I know you just came back from Berlin where you said you saw some great public art. How does Somerville stack up um, against other cities as far as public art goes? It's a good question. Um, I would say that Somerville has a really wonderful group of pieces. They tend to be a little bit less visible as you are in the center of town or if you're in uh, the different squares. You don't necessarily see the art right away the way that you do in some places like Berlin. Um, but they're here and that's why the map is such a wonderful resource because now we can find the pieces without having to explore every little street in the city. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have, we, we have some really exciting pieces of all different styles. And I think that's also a nice aspect that some of the pieces are a little smaller, a little, a little hidden, but when you stumble upon them, it's a nice little surprise. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of uh, public art that most people might not be aware of, can you tell us about Lizzie the Lizard? Sure. Um, so Lizzie the Lizard is a mosaic lizard that I sculpted out of cement and then mosaiced. Um, she's walking down the side of the front steps of my house in Davis Square, outside Davis Square. And um, she, she was a really fun project to do. I have a lot of glass scrap around because I do stained glass. And I, I thought about some ways to use it. And when we sculpted Lizzie we decided to have it be a community project to mosaic her so when Somerville Open Studios happened a couple of years ago we invited people who were coming by to add pieces and we had many neighbors and people who just happened to walk down the street add pieces and still to still now people come by and they say look I added that piece and I, I really like that it's something people can can feel ownership of. That's great and that's a perfect segue to this piece of public art we're standing in front of this is also um, it conveys information it's public art and it's community building. Can you tell us a little bit about this mural? Sure. So this is one of the very first data murals that um, we've been creating here in Somerville and one's in Cambridge and one, one was done with a, a global group. Um, this, this mural is created by Groundwork Somerville. It tells the story of what Groundwork Somerville does and why. So it begins with some information about what's happening in terms of health and how hard it is to access healthy food, particularly at a reasonable cost. And then it talks about how many unused beds there are in Somerville that could turn into garden beds, um, unused lots rather, that could turn into garden beds, and then how many square feet of land Groundwork Somerville has already successfully turned into garden space. Then it talks about um, what that actually does in the community and how more than 2,000 people every year buy 
reduced price, healthy, fresh, local produce from the mobile markets that Groundwork Somerville and Shape Up Somerville run in the city. And it also talks about the benefits to the youth who work as members of the green team and um, people who are part of Groundwork's summer camp programs and what, what they learn, but also the fact that they bike around the city, the fact that they're moving, that they learn about vegetables that they've never really tried before, and then how all of that leads to economic stability and community building within the city of Somerville. So that's not really my story. It's actually the story that the, a group of students from Prospect Hill Academy uh, t figured out how to tell based on the numbers and the data that Groundwork had. So those, those students worked with me to figure out how to represent that information in a way that really told the story visually. And then the green team, which is a group of youth that works with Groundwork Somerville every summer, they did the painting. So they worked with me to transfer that image up onto the wall to paint it. And they, they really they learned a lot in the process. Talking to them afterwards, I, I heard from all of them that they now feel like they could look at information and turn it into a story that they could tell, that they felt more comfortable painting, that they loved the fact that this story was here to tell, that they understood what Groundwork does in a new way. And most importantly, we were invited to do the project because this fence was rusty and ugly and wasn't contributing to make this feel like a farm. It just felt like a parking lot. And so by transforming it and painting it, um, it, it really changes the space. And so we're proud of it. Thank you so much. Um, and also thank you for Lizzie the Lizard. And thank you for um, helping create the Somerville art map. Absolutely. It's been fun. I am here with Seth Wolfwood um, of the Pirate Ship. Thanks for speaking with us today. Thank you. So this is one of my favorite pieces of public art in Somerville. Um, can you tell us, well first tell us a little bit about the Pirate Ship and then how this mural came to be. Uh, so Pirate Ship is a co-working space here in Somerville. Uh, we're right next to the Market Basket and the, uh, the Indian Grocery here in, uh, on Somerville Ave. Uh, we're a co-working hackerspace, makerspace, uh, filled with about 20 artists, musicians, programmers, designers, developers, and a bunch of other things. Excellent. Now, how did this mural come about? Well, so uh, early in the Pirate Ship days, we had a Minecraft server, and Minecraft is a game where you build things with block-like shapes, kind of like Lego. And uh, we built this pirate ship to represent uh, to represent us in our Minecraft server, and we liked it so much that we turned around and we we uh, projected it much larger and and drew it out and made a mural out of it to represent us in our kind of public space. And does it represent the pirate ship because it's a conflation of art and technology? Absolutely. Uh, Minecraft is is a very limitless game of, of creativity and exploration and art and science and technology, and I think that represents us pretty well. And I think that uh, we've been trying to find a way to make ourselves more visible in the Somerville community, and I think that this mural is a great way to do that. Excellent. Um, and do you have uh, f favorite pieces of public art here in the city? Um, yeah, I really like the Bubbles mural over over that direction. Washington Street, I think. On Washington Street. Uh -huh. And um, I'm very, very fond of the Space Dog right around the corner. All right, well, let's go check out the Space Dog. So here we are next to the Space Dog. Um, now, can you tell me a little bit about this piece? What do you know about it? I know very little. Um, I think it's a gorgeous piece of work. Um, I'm very glad it's here, and I hope it stays. Um, and I would love to find out more about the artist. Now, you mentioned that um, the artist has done some other things around town. Yeah, I've seen a couple other variations of this this dog uh, in a few other places around Somerville and, and Boston. but. You know, I, I just would love to know more, and I love to know the variations, and I need to get some good photos of it, really. Yeah. Hopefully you guys can do that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's certainly very, very playful. It's worth coming down to the Market Basket parking lot and checking this out. And one more thing. Now, we were talking about the, the graffiti that you see. Um, I think to the passerby, sometimes graffiti looks all the same, but you were saying it can often be more involved than that. Yeah, well, you know, it, it looks a little formulaic um, to, to a casual observer, but, you know, you really need 
rules and, and a format for medium to be able to be playful with it. And um, I, I had friends and, and artists and, and people kind of explain some of the, the nuances to me. And there's a lot of richness and nuance in the art form. And uh, I really appreciate it. Nice. Now, my final question, are you, in fact, a pirate? I am, in fact, a pirate. R. R. <laughs> So now I'm with Christy Chase from the Historic Preservation Commission work for the city of Somerville. We're standing in front of the Somerville Main Library. And Christy, you're going to tell us about the bull skulls um, that are in the frieze along the f front facade of the library. What's the story behind these bull skulls? Okay. The bull skulls are called Bucrania or Bucranes or a singular one is Bucranium. And uh, they were originally the result of... Greek and Roman, mytho I won't say mythology because this is, I gathered, fairly well documented that in, when an important event was occurring and the wanted to know what was going on, they would take a special sacrificial steer, bring it to the temple, and they would put a bowl underneath the bowl and then they would eviscerate it and the, and the, the entrails would fall into the bowl and they would read the signs, the portents, the omens on what was going to happen. And so the Bucranium became a symbol for the search for knowledge. You find them on buildings like libraries, courthouses, schools, um, churches, or at least some churches, uh, where they want to emphasize knowledge and that's what people are there for. Interesting. And can you tell me about the other symbols along the facade of the library, the within the frieze? I believe be the what I think the circular object between the frieze, I believe, is a patera or the bowl in which the entrails were caught. And then you see the books. So to me, we have this symbol ongoing that has been done, uh, documented from. Greek and Latin Roman times through to today uh, in the 1800s particularly and early 1900s with the Beaux-Arts style buildings you had all of these classical motifs that would be used and reused. People do occasionally ask me what they mean and local lore says that it's because Somerville had slaughterhouses and that was a major industry from about 1850 to about into the 1960s. So there is that connection there, but I believe that the skulls are there more because of their classical interpretation rather than the physical one of having slaughterhouses. Interesting. Well, Christy, thank you so much. And I think this is a great example of how art is really everywhere in our city. Can you give us one or two other examples of art that is part of an architectural detail in the city? I've noticed that on City Hall, there are two angels on either side of the doorway up on the top floor. I Somebody called my attention to them, and I haven't really looked at them real carefully, but they're really interesting. And one seems to be holding a book, and the other one is there as well. These And that was done in the 1920s. When you look at the high school, you'll see at the tops of the columns, there'll be faces of various people. And so... I don't know who these people are, but it's really sort of interesting seeing the faces and the sculpture up there. So there's still research and, and more investigation to be done? Always, always. There's lots to learn, and finding and spying these treasures uh, can be really fun. Absolutely. Now, this is um, an example of an older piece of what we're calling public art in the city. When, um, when does the library date to and this freeze date to? About 1903, uh, the Mayor Glines was really instrumental in doing a lot of civic buildings up here. 
the libraries. Uh, I believe he was associated with the Armory Building and um, the Prospect Hill Monument. Interesting. Well, Christy, thank you so much for speaking with us. You're a wealth of information on the history of our fair city. <laughs> You're welcome. If you have a question that I can answer, I will try. It's always fun to do research if I don't know. Excellent. So give Christy a call if you have a question about a piece of historical public art in our city. 